Hello, my name is Michelle and I am an RSTP trainer located in Ottawa. I will be hosting today's training session. Uh, there is quite a bit of information to share as we take you on a walkthrough demonstration for how to use the permanent residence portal for private sponsorship applications. We'll also be providing micro learning video clips on our YouTube channel for some of the basic steps that you may want to refer back to without having to preview the length of your training session recording. Since we are meeting today on a virtual platform, I would like to begin by acknowledging that each one of us here today are lo located in various places across this nation we call Canada. And we are each residing on the traditional territory of many First Nations peoples. I would like to specifically acknowledge that Toronto, the location of the RSTP main office, is situated on the lands of many First Nations peoples, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Dish with One Spoon, Wampum Belt, and Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. We invite you to personally dedicate time to learn about, reflect on, and acknowledge the history and land of the First Nations peoples where you reside, and to also personally consider how we can each, in our own way, move forward in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. So for those that are not familiar with RSTP, RSTP stands for Refugee Sponsorship Training Program. However, we do not provide training for the province of Quebec, which has its own immigration system and a different refugee sponsorship program. We are a program designed to support groups of five, community sponsors and sponsorship agreement holder organizations in Canada, which are commonly known by SAS and their constituent groups and co-sponsors. We are funded by IRCC and RSTP trainers are employed by Catholic Cross-Cultural Services. There are trainers located across Canada and you can also visit our website to find a trainer near you. There is a trainer in British Columbia. We have trainers in Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Atlantic provinces, Ontario, and in Ontario, we do have quite a few. We have uh, trainers in the GT area, Southern Ontario, and as I mentioned, I am in Ottawa. You can find any of our contact information on our website under rstp.ca slash contact us. So this is our agenda for today. And as, I can, as you can see, there's uh, quite a bit to learn today. Uh, we'll begin by explaining how to create a user account and how to sign in, followed by how do we initiate an application, inviting group members and the principal applicant if desired? We'll take a look at the information needed for the principal applicant in each of the group members, and then we'll show you the direct input online digital forms, as well as how to upload any required PDF forms, supporting documents and additional forms needed for the private sponsorship application. We'll conclude with information about the principal applicant declaration and what to do if the principal applicant does not have access to the portal. Keep in mind that during this training session, we will not be going into detail about the application forms themselves. We have specific sessions scheduled, which you can register for at this time. And you can register via the training calendar on our website. So on rstp.ca, we have a training calendar. And you're able to register for those sessions that are specific to explaining the new forms and the changes to the applicable guides for groups of five, community sponsors, and sponsorship agreement holders. 
So with that understanding, let's focus our attention now on how to navigate and use the permanent resident portal for submitting applications for the private sponsorship of a refugees program. To access the permanent resident portal, you can type in the web address in the browser URL field or simply type PR portal into Google. Once the web page opens, you will see the title and the description for the portal. And below that, you will have the option to sign into your account or to reset your password if you already have an account, but maybe forgot your password. If you don't already have an account, you also have the option to create a new user account. Before we continue with how to create a user account, let's take a look at the options ASA has when they have multiple staff or volunteers. Your organization, so your SA, may have more than one person listed on file with IRCC as the main contact. It's it's pretty it's pretty typical. There are some SAs who have more than one contact. They maybe have two or three contacts. You may also have previously emailed applications to IRCC from those persons listed on file with IRCC. So you may be thinking that it will be easiest to have each person create their own primary sponsors, user accounts for the PR portal. However, creating multiple primary sponsor user accounts is not recommended. This is because it does make it a little bit more difficult to keep track of all of your SAT applications as a whole in the online portal. And IRCC would also prefer that you stick to one primary contact email address for use when creating your SAS primary sponsor user account for the portal. And we'll provide you with an example just to kind of explain to you why, why it would be preferred and it's not recommended to have multiple user accounts. So in this example, we have Joe and Jane who were both named as main contact persons for their SA with IRCC. And each one decided to create their own primary sponsor user account for the portal. So now we have two primary sponsor accounts with one SAP. Joe would only be able to see the applications he has initiated. Similarly, Jean would only be able to see the applications she has initiated. So this becomes a problem if Joe is asked to help Jane with completing an application for a sponsorship group in her region while she's away on holidays. The application can only be seen and accessed by Joe if he initiated it using his own user account. The recommended practice is to only have one single primary sponsor user account that's shared by multiple persons for the SAT. So if you have three or four contact persons, you would only have one single primary sponsor user account under the SAM. This way, both persons can view and work on any of the initiated applications that belong to the SA within the PR portal. It is also not recommended to use your personal email addresses for the primary sponsor user account. This is because when a person is no longer a key staff or volunteer member of your SA, you cannot change the email address associated with their primary user account after it's already been created. And consequently, you will not be able to access any open applications that have not yet been submitted. So this may be tricky. Instead, it is recommended to use a shared email address, as mentioned, for creating the primary sponsor account, which has all also been provided to IRCC, and for creating a single primary sponsor user account for the PR portal which will be used by each staff person for your SA when creating and submitting applications via the portal. So when a SA wants to have more than one person access the PR portal using the SAS primary sponsor user account, they're choosing to provide the sign-in information to each one of their staff members and perhaps also to specific volunteers who assist with preparing the applications for submission. 
So it's certainly possible to have multiple persons logged in on, on one primary sponsor user account at the same time. So you can have five or six, seven people logged in at the same time under the one primary sponsor user account. However, uh, best practice is to ensure that each person is not working on the same application at the same time. So they would all be working on different applications and that's okay. It might be best to have each person log in at different times to maybe ensure that the data they have entered will be saved without any issues. So when a person leaves their role as a staff or volunteer with the SAT, it's best practice to change the password for the primary sponsor user account that they had access to previously. So each person who accesses the same primary sponsor user account will be able to invite group members as well as the principal applicant if desired. So invited group members and the principal applicant will only have access to the applications they're invited to. So for SAS who do not want their volunteers to have full access to submit applications or to invite group members, they should not share the sign-in information for the primary sponsor user account. Instead, you can create a temporary group member user account, which volunteers can use to sign in and work on any applications they have been invited to. So you will be providing them access to assist with filing the forms and uploading documents, but then you would need to remove them as the group member before submitting the application. So any information typed into the forms by the volunteer or any PDF documents they have uploaded will remain even after that temporary group member has been deleted. So the temporary group member will not need to upload any personal documents to their profile in order to work on the application. So when you first create a user account, you will need to provide a working email address, which will be associated with your permanent resident portal user account. So please make sure that this is an email address that you check emails from regularly. For groups of five, you will need to provide a designated personal email address that you intend to use for communicating with IRCC. And please note that once a permanent resident portal user account has been created, you cannot change the email address associated with that user account. For community sponsorship groups, you may want to create a designated organizational email address that you will use for all communications with IRCC, which will also be associated with the single primary sponsor user account in the portal. So for example, if my organization's name was Lifeboat, then the email address to use for the primary sponsor could be sponsorships at lifeboat.org. Again, you cannot change the email address associated with the user account once it already has been created. Sponsorship agreement holders will need to create a single primary sponsor user account. The email address should match the one on the file at IRCC for the SAS primary contact. The SAS primary contact email address should not be a personal email address, but rather a designated email address that will be regularly used for the organization's private sponsorship communications. It would be best practice to use an email address that is not easily replicated or can be guessed by including a random series of numbers and letters, for example, something like this. So the email address placed here cannot be changed after it has been created, which is why using a personal email account is not recommended. Next, you will need to choose a password that has a unique combination of letters, numbers, and characters. If your password does not meet any of the six criteria, that are listed here. So for example, a minimum of eight characters needing to have at least one number or one lowercase character. If your password does not meet any of these six listed here, the missing requirement will not have a green check mark next to it. In this case, we do not have 
any special characters in the password. So once you have entered a password that meets each of these requirements, click on the checkbox to indicate that you have read and accept the terms of use and privacy policy. Then simply click on the create account button. And you can now expect to receive an email that contains a unique verification code. If you don't receive that, or if you don't see that in your main folder, email folder, check your spam folder. Sometimes there are moments where it goes into your spam folder instead of your inbox. You will need to enter the code into this field in order to complete the user account registration. So where it says enter verification code. And once you have entered the verification code, click on the complete registration button. If you have entered the code correctly, then you will see a green confirmation box appear at the top of the page. Your user account creation is now complete. And so you can now use the email address and password, which you had chosen during the account creation process to log into the portal. To access the permanent residence portal, you can type the web address into the browser URL field or simply type your portal into Google to find the web address. So similarly as before, once the web page opens, you can sign into your account with the email and password associated with the account. And then you'll click on the green button that says sign in. So once that's complete, this page will open up. And that will mean that you're signed into your account because at the top right side, you will see your email address displayed and an option to sign out. So that means you're already logged into your user account. Now let's take a look at how to initiate an application. You will need to scroll down the page until you see this section here. The right side of the page can be disregarded since this function is intended for persons already in Canada who need to apply for, who need to renew, or who need to replace their permanent resident card or permanent resident travel document. The left side of the page is where you have the choice to either start a new application or to view your existing applications. Just a reminder that only a primary sponsor will click on the, the button that says start a new application since they're the only ones who will initiate the application. For all other group members who have been invited to join an online application, you would select the, the button that says view my permanent residence applications. Before we continue on to see how a primary sponsor will initiate a new application, let's take a quick look at an example of what the listing of permanent residence applications will look like after they have been created in the portal. As you can see, we have several applications listed in this example, and you should be aware of a few things when accessing your own listing of applications. If you are a primary sponsor, you will see a listing of all the applications you have initiated, as well as any other applications you have been invited to that are based on the email address that is associated with your particular portal user account. So what this means for community sponsorship groups who undertake several applications each year, you may want to use the same primary sponsor user account if it is important for you to keep track of all of the application submissions in one place. If you are a group member who has been invited to a single application, for example, if you are a group of five member who is not the primary sponsor, or maybe you are a co-sponsor or a constituent group for a staff, then you would only see that one application in your listing. However, if you have been invited to multiple applications, then you would see all of the applications you have been invited to, as long as you use the same email address for each application. If you had provided a different email address for some of the applications you were invited to, and you had created a different portal user account for each one, then you will not see all of those applications in one place. So let's take a look at the type of information that portal users can expect to see in their listing of applications. So in the very first column is where you'll see the application name. 
So this is a specific title which is chosen when an application is initiated. It will not be used for any other reason than to help you locate a particular application from within the listing. So you would choose a name for the application that would work best, one that would help you to easily identify a particular application. A simple naming convention you may wish to use is to start with the family name of the principal applicant in all capital letters, followed by their given name and their date of birth. For sponsorship agreement holders or other sponsorship groups who work with several applications, you may want to create a naming convention that includes the name of a constituent group or the co-sponsor, or if you already have an internal database numbering system, you may also wish to use that unique number. If an application was submitted, the primary sponsor will see a link here under the application name column to download the entire application package as a zip file. In the second column, you will see the program identifier, which in the case of private sponsorship refugees applicants, it would always show as refugee. If, however, you had used your PR portal user account to create a family class application, it would also show up in your listing of applications with the category of family displayed. The category column will show you which type of application it is. So here it says the PSR program, group of five, PSR program, community sponsor, PSR program, sponsorship agreement holder. The next column will show the date that a completed application was submitted, or if an application has been returned, that date and timestamp will also be visible here. And the status column will show you the progress of an application within the portal. It will not display the progress of an application beyond the date of submission or being returned. So the processing status after IRCC receives a complete application submission cannot be tracked here. So for an application that has been initiated and it's still being edited, it will show up as yellow, which means in progress. An application that has been submitted to IRCC will appear as a green submitted bar. Applications which have been returned will have a red returned bar showing. Under the actions column, you will click on the view button to open the application. And next to that is the delete button. If you are a primary sponsor, when you select delete, it deletes everything for that application. If you are an invited group member, you cannot delete the application. If you want to be removed from the application, the primary sponsor will need to do that. Now let's go back to the home page to see how a primary sponsor will initiate an application. So an application can be initiated from the PR portal homepage. And again, just a reminder that only a primary sponsor will click on the start new application button since they alone have the designated responsibility to initiate an application. In the handouts, you'll also be able to find information on how to determine who can be the primary sponsor for your sponsorship group. So to start a new application, the primary sponsor could click the menu option at the top of the page here to start a new application, or they could scroll down to the section of the home page and click the start new application button here. Before the application can be generated by the system, you must identify the type of application you wish to create. Remember that this portal is used for several immigration streams, so we have to identify that this is an application for private sponsorship and which type of sponsorship group so that the correct application forms are generated by the system. So you'll click on the first drop down box arrow and select refugee and then click on the next drop down box arrow and select the private sponsorship of refugees program, the category. And next you will choose your group type. So your sponsorship group type. For this demonstration, we'll select a group of five. Then enter in the application title name. You will remember that this will show up on your listing of applications. 
So choose a name that can easily be identified because you cannot change this name after the application has been created. And finally, click on the continue button. And here is where you will enter in your name as the primary sponsor. Remember that any one of the group of five members can be designated to be the primary sponsor. It would be beneficial if you choose the person who knows how to use computers and is comfortable with reviewing all of the forms and documents before submitting them. When completing these online forms, Whenever you see a red asterisk, this means that you must provide a response. When it comes to a sponsorship agreement holder, however, you must insert the name of the primary contact, which is on the file at IRCC. When you click on the continue button, you should see a success notification letting you know that the application has been created. At this point, you could log out of the portal if you wanted to, but you'll still be able to resume working on it at another time. To access the listing of your applications, simply select View My Applications from the menu item here. As you can see, the application is now visible here in the listing, so to resume working on it again, you would simply click on the View button here. After the application has been initiated, you will be directed to the principal applicant's profile page. Alternatively, you may wish to invite other group members to this application first if you do not yet have the refugees information. So simply click on the menu item here to open the group member page. For groups of five, there will be a notification symbol displayed like this one where there are still group members who have not yet been invited. So in this case, we'll go ahead and enter in the information required for the principal applicant, such as the preferred language of correspondence, as well as their full name and date of birth. Next will be the mailing address information and an option to select whether or not their residential address is the same as their mailing address. If it's not, then you will need to insert information for the current place they are residing. Next, you will click the button to add a dependent of the principal applicant, if applicable. An input box will open up for you to complete. And once you have entered the information, the Save Detail button will become active. So you'll click on it to save the information, and you can now see that a dependent has been added. You can also go back and edit the information if needed, or you can delete the added dependent if you realize that maybe it was added in by mistake. Or you could go on to add another dependent if you wish, or come back to add more dependents at another time. When you're finished, you'll click Save and Continue. Now let's take a look at how to invite other people to the application. So we'll first begin with adding additional sponsors. You would need to add the other signatories to the application. So for a group of five, this would be the remaining four or more group members. If you are a SA, you may want to invite constituent group members or maybe co-sponsors you're currently working with. So you'll click on the invite additional sponsor button here. This will open up the section where you will insert their information. And if you are a SA who works with volunteers that are not parties to the sponsorship, but you want them to be able to assist with the application, you may wish to create a temporary group member access for them. So to do so, you will want to name the group member using a standard title so it's easy to identify this invited member in the portal. So for example, in the family name field, you could enter temporary member um, and volunteer under the given name field. So this is important so that you will remember to delete the temporary group member access from the application prior to submitting the application to IRCC. SAS may also want to create a dedicated email address for your organization's volunteers, which you would use for any temporary access for the digital portal for your staff. Remember when you add a person as a group member here, 
they can fill out the forms and upload documents, but they don't have the ability to submit the application. Only the primary sponsor has that ability. So if you are inviting a party to the sponsorship, then you would simply enter in their information and then click on the send invite button. Doing so will send an automated email to the person you have invited to the application. They must then follow the unique link in the email sent and log in to the portal using the same email address that the invitation was sent to you and to use the temporary password that is provided in that email as well. Now you can see that the person we have invited is now included here. Each invited person's information will appear as separate blocks of information. For groups of five, there'll be a warning message like this when there are not four or more additional group members invited. Once you have invited at least four other members, this warning message will disappear. If you need to remove a group member, it can be done here, but only before the application has been submitted. After you've already submitted the application, you would need to contact IRCC if a group member needs to be replaced. You also have the ability to resend a temporary password to a member that's been invited if they did not open the email they had received within 30 days of being invited. The temporary password expires after 30 days. So if it has been more than 30 days, you're still able to send a temporary password. Invited members will only be able to click on the more details button for their own block of information. So they're only able to see their information. They can't access the protected details for other group members. So this protected section is where any documents which contain sensitive information are to be uploaded. Only the invited person and in the primary sponsor will be able to access and view documents which have been uploaded here. As you can see, for a group of five member, there are several documents to be uploaded in this section. So sponsors must follow the guides to ensure they upload the required documents, even if a particular item listed here does not have a red asterisk within the portal. So for example, for a group of five, uh, financial profiles and proof of funds are going to be required to be uploaded by the specific financial contributors, but not by every group of five member. So simply click on the upload button next to an identified item in this listing that you are going to provide a document for. For each uploaded document, there is a specific naming convention that should be used, and there are other file preparation requirements that you would need to follow before uploading documents to the portal. So let's take a closer look at the file preparation requirements, which include accepted file types, the file size, the file naming, and acceptable characters to use when naming files. So the type of files that are acceptable for uploading are PDF files. You can also add image files such as JPG, JPEG, and PNG, or document file types such as doc or docx. The maximum size a file can be is four megabytes. So there will be a warning message in the portal if your size is too big. If you need to reduce a file size, you can use a free online website called ilovepdf.com or a similar online tool. When uploading images, the smallest resolution size should be 420 by 540 pixels. For file naming, you must include the last name followed by a dash and then the first name followed by a dash and then the document type it is. Then you'll also follow that by a dash and then an item number if you're uploading multiple files using the same document type name. So Roco has confirmed, however, that they would prefer PDFs where the multiple files are merged into one document rather than uploading separate PDF files for each document of the same type. We'll go over this again. We'll explain this further in the next slide. The allowable characters that can be used when naming your file name are upper and lower case letters, numbers, dashes, underscores, or dot. So for francophones, this is particularly important because you cannot use the French keyboard letters that have accents, even when it is for a person's name. 
So let's take a look at a case example based on this principal applicant, their spouse and child. For example, if the principal applicant has some documents to include for proof of education, such as a diploma and a certificate, these documents could be saved as separate files and using file names that are the same, except they include a sequential number at the end. Or if you're able to merge these documents into one PDF file that is less than four megabytes in size, then Roco would prefer that. When uploading photos for the family, each photo can be uploaded separately where the file name must include the name of the person in that photo. So for example, this is how each of the photo files will be named for the principal applicant and the spouse and the dependent child. So they will each have their own name on each PDF. However, again, if you prefer, you may merge all of those photos into one PDF file that is less than four megabytes and simply use the principal applicant's name along with the file name of photos. When it comes to file naming for specific forms and other supporting documents, be sure you are using the appropriate names based on the documents being uploaded. So for the principal applicant schedule two, you would include the name of the principal applicant and the title of the form. Same goes for the RSD document, the refugee status determination document. You would use the principal applicant's name and include RSD for the title. Same goes for the principal applicant's declaration. And if you're uploading the undertaking document, you can use the principal applicant's name followed by undertaken as shown in the example here. When you are uploading specific forms or documents for individ individual sponsors, you must include the individual sponsor's name as well as what the document type it is. So for example, the financial profiles will be named according to the sponsor it belongs to, as in this example here. So Jane Doe financial profile, John Doe financial profile. The same goes for the sponsor assessment forms or for any ID documents for proving a sponsor's Canadian status. So you'll write Smith Joe, sponsor assessment, Smith Jane, sponsor assessment, and so on. So once you have invited the group members, if you scroll down the page, you have the option to invite the principal applicant, and you can also invite a representative for the principal applicant. Of course, if the refugee doesn't have sufficient language skills or internet access, you do not have to invite them to the online application in the portal. Sponsors can select no here. So will the principal applicant be able to sign the application digitally in the portal? We can select no if they don't have access to the portal or internet, but you will then need to upload a PDF version of the refugee's digitally signed declaration form. So when you invite an immigration representative, you will act on behalf of the principal applicant with IRCC and you'll fill in their name and email address. And you are required to identify whether they are a registered representative or not. So registered representatives are paid representatives such as an immigration lawyer or a licensed consultant, an immigration consultant. And if the intended representative is not registered, then they are considered to be unpaid representatives. So regardless of being paid or unpaid reps, they will need to upload the use of representative form, which authorizes them to act on behalf of the principal applicant. So keep in mind that once a representative has been invited, they cannot be removed from the application. So once they're invited, you would need to contact IRCC by email externally to the portal if there will be a change to the representative. So when you select the no option, meaning the representative is not being paid to act on behalf of the principal applicant with IRCC, such as a family member in Canada, then that person will be sent an invitation to create a user account in the permanent resident portal. They will then have the same level of permissions to access the online application as the principal applicant would have had. So this means that the representative can edit, 
They can also view the refugee forms and they can also upload supporting documents and forms on behalf of the refugee. So if it's select yes, then that representative is registered and this paid representative will be sent an invitation with the link to sign into the immigration representatives portal to access the principal applicants online application. When the paid representative first creates their user account for the immigration representative portal, they would need to provide their membership ID, the name of their firm or the name of their company, as well as the governing body. So once they have signed in, they can edit and view the refugees application forms, and they can also upload supporting documents and additional forms on behalf of the principal applicant. Now let's take a look at how to access the application forms and where to upload the sponsorship documents. The primary sponsor, as well as any other invited persons, can access the application to complete the online forms and upload any required documents. To access this page, you would click on the application menu item here on the top right of your screen. On the left side of your screen, you'll see the quick navigation menu. So these are simply quick links to jump to a particular section of the page. If it's your first time viewing this page, however, please do take time to scroll down manually and read the information provided for you. In particular, you would want to scroll to the before you start section where there are links for you to access relevant guides and checklists, which you would need to refer to when completing the application forms. As you can see in these instructions, you would need to select and complete every single form that's available within this page. So as we mentioned earlier, this portal is used by other immigration stream applicants. So not all of the forms are going to be used for the private sponsorship of refugees application submissions. So this is why it's very important to follow the guides and document checklist, which are linked here to ensure you are including the correct items. Now let's click on this quick menu buttons to jump to IMM 0008 section. So in this section of the page, you can see that the generic application form falls under the heading digital forms for group of five. If you are a sponsorship agreement holder, it will display digital forms for sponsorship agreement holders and for community sponsors groups, it will display digital forms for community sponsors. So in this initial release of the permanent resident portal, only the principal applicants generic application and schedule A are available to complete online from within the portal. Below that section, you will see the PDF forms for group of five section, which contains the required undertaking form for your particular sponsorship group type, as well as the refugees schedule two form. The sponsors forms and the schedule two can be downloaded from the provided links below the form number. So these forms are to be completed offline, meaning you do not need to be logged into the portal to complete them. When the forms have been completed and signed and the file has been saved according to the correct size and naming convention, then you would simply click on this button to upload the undertaking form and then click here to upload the principal applicant's schedule to. If they are dependents over 18, you will need to click this button again to upload their schedule to as well. And now let's take a look at the online version of the generic application form. So you will first see some information to read before proceeding to the form. So be sure to click on the link for the instruction guide, which will guide you in how to complete this form. You should also have copies of supporting documents for the refugee family, for example, passports or national identity documents or the refugee status determination documents or the RSC documents if they have them, because you will need to fill in their personal information based on those documents. Then you'll click on the continue button and on the left side is a new menu tree, which will show you which section of the online generic application you're on. 
So you will not be able to navigate to the next section until all of the required fields have been entered and saved. On this section of the form, you will notice that the online version does not indicate that this particular question is a required field. So this does not mean you can leave it blank. Remember, the generic application form is used by several other immigration streams, and some of them do not have to complete this field. But for private sponsorship refugee applicants, it must be filled out or it will be returned by IRCC. So where exactly do they plan to live in Canada? They need to select the province and the city, and typically it's where the, the sponsors, the sponsorship group is located. So when you have entered in all the fields with the red asterisk, then you can click on the save and continue button to proceed. And you can certainly go back in again at a later time to fill in the remaining fields that are necessary for the PSR application. When you have navigated through each of these sections and completed all of the fields with the red asterisk, you will see a green check mark next to each menu item. So this does not mean that you have filled in all of the required information within each of these sections. It simply means that the fields with the red asterisks have been entered and saved. When you get to the dependence section, it's important to read the information displayed here. In particular, you will need to click on the link here to open the principal applicant profile page if you have not yet added their spouse or partner or their dependents to the application. So you must first do this before moving on to the personal details for each dependent, which will then be listed here after they've all been added to the principal applicant's profile page. Once you have completed all of the personal details for each dependent, a completed status will be displayed, as you can see here. And then the button here will become visible, the button that says complete and return to application. And that button will take you back to the main navigation page for the application. You will now see a green check mark next to IMM0008 menu item. So keep in mind that this is not an indication that you have filled in all of the necessary information. It's only an indication that the fields with the red asterisk have been completed for the generic application form. Now let's take a quick look at the additional application form section. You will have the option to search for and add additional forms here. Most of the forms in this drop down list are for other immigration streams. So the ones that are relevant to the PSR program applicants are the optional forms, such as the user representative form, the appointment of a representative in the expected community of settlement, and the declaration from uh, non-accompanying parents or guardian for minors immigrating to Canada. So the declaration from non-accompanying parent or guardian for minors immigrating to Canada, that is the parental consent declaration form that is provided in cases where the principal applicant is divorced and wants to bring their child to live in Canada. So let's move on to the supporting documents section now. So since this is a group of five application, the two documents that have to be uploaded here are the photos and the RSD document. So the refugee status determination document. For community sponsors, these two documents will also be listed here. For SAS, only the photo requirements will be listed as a required document to be uploaded here. The refugee applicants may have additional supporting documentation to include with the application. You can search for the document type here. And if you want to quickly locate a particular title, you can type the first letter of the title in the search field. So here I have pre-populated the application with the various document titles that may be used for the principal applicant's additional supporting documents. So travel documents and passports, proof of language profici proficiency, identity and civil status documents, and letter of explanation, police certificates and clearances, and so on. And as I scroll down, you can see that there are quite a few that you can choose from. So when searching through the available document titles within the drop-down list, please be aware that many of these options available are only to be used for other immigration streams. So I wouldn't worry or stress about making sure I have a document for each one of these options. 
So in particular, you should now use the title option called uh, translations and affidavit. Um, instead, you're expected to include the translation in the same PDF file as the original document. So for example, if the principal applicant has a police report to upload, you would select the title option called police report and then upload a PDF document that includes both the report and the translation together in that one file. The file naming convention for this PDF document would need to have the principal applicant's family name, a dash, principal applicant's given name, and another dash followed by the title police report. Now let's take a look at the last section, the principal applicant's declaration. So if the principal applicant was not invited to the application previously, you will need to download a PDF version of the consent and declarations form for the principal applicant to sign. So that form will act as a digital signature. And if you don't see the link here to download the form and the upload button is grayed out, this is a good indication that you left the toggle option on yes instead of no within the group members page. So you'll click here to access the manage group members page. Then it will take you back to that question, will the principal applicant be able to sign the application digitally in the portal? So you'll choose no. And then when you go back to the application, you should see the link to download the form and the upload button will be active once again. If, however, you had opted to invite the principal applicant and they have access to internet, they're able to access the portal. When you return to the declaration section, there will be a view button for the primary sponsor to check to see if the principal applicant's electronic signature has been completed. So keep in mind that only the refugee can complete and electronically sign their declaration. Sponsors or immigration representatives cannot sign on behalf of the principal applicant. When the refugee logs into their account, they will see a start button to access their consent and declaration form. And when this online version of the form opens, the principal applicant will read the information here and then click on their preferred response options to these questions. Then they will need to scroll down and continue to read all of the information in this declaration so they understand what they're agreeing to. In order to give their consent, they will need to electronically sign the declaration page by typing in their full name into the field here. Then they would scroll down where they will see that the blue button is now active, which they can now click to continue. So where it says complete and return to application. After the refugee declaration is finished, you can scroll down to see where the application submission button is located. As you can see, the button is grayed out because we haven't yet finished everything that needs to be done. Below that button, you can see warning messages, which will indicate what the sponsors need to complete before the application can be submitted. So that button may also be grayed out if you're not the primary sponsor. If you're not a primary sponsor, you're not able to submit the applications. Remember that also, it's not just the primary sponsor, but it is also the paid immigration representative for the sponsor that can also submit the completed applications. So before they submit the application, the primary sponsor will need to review the whole application in its entirety to ensure that nothing is missing, to ensure that they're paying particular attention to that all required information has been included in the online digital forms, as well as reviewing all, all of the uploaded forms and documents to verify that the application is complete. PSR applicants can disregard the point here to include proof you have paid your fees, so they can disregard that. This is a reminder for other immigration streams. PSR applications do not have a fee. Once every warning message has been addressed, the confirm and submit button will now become active. If the primary sponsor is satisfied that everything is in order, they can click the button to submit the application to IRCC. Once an application has been submitted, it can no longer be edited within the portal. So once it's submitted, it's gone. Similarly as to when you submit via email or when you were submitting via mail, 
once it's submitted, there is no more editing that can be done. An exception to this restriction, however, will occur when IOCC finds that the application is incomplete. So in this case, Roco will send an email externally to the primary sponsor with an explanation of what exactly is missing. The application will become unlocked again in the portal, but only for the primary sponsor to make the necessary corrections. So when you're submitting it, it's locked. And when Roco notices that there is something missing, that their application is incomplete, they will unlock it and only the primary sponsor can make the necessary changes. The principal applicant will need to re-sign their declaration again if the changes required are related to their portion of the application. So keep in mind that there is no longer going to be a fixed period of time by which you will need to resubmit the application via the portal. So this is because the processing time will not begin until a complete application is received by Roco. So if the sponsor waits 30 days to resubmit the corrected application, then the processing day stamp for placing the application in the queue for processing will not be until that later time frame. So for example, if you submitted it January 1st and it wasn't complete, it was sent back to you and you now re sending it with the corrected forms, the corrected application, and you resend it on January 15th, the processing time your application will be placed in the queue as of January 15th, not January 1st. So the application submission date will be according to the most recent submission date. It will not be backtracked to the date of the first submission. Now let's take a look at when you can expect to receive an automated email. The PR portal will send out automated emails following certain user actions. So the very first one will be sent out to the primary sponsor who initiates an application. They will be the only one to receive this notification, informing them that the application has been started in the portal. If the principal applicant has been invited, to the online application, they will receive an email notification with a unique link inviting them to log into the portal. The same goes for other sponsorship group members. They will each receive an automated email with a unique link to log into the portal. If there is an immigration representative for the principal applicant, so for example, an unpaid rep, they would also need to be invited and will receive an email notification with a unique link to log into the portal. If, however, it is a paid immigration representative, so an immigration lawyer, an immigration consultant, who has initiated the application as a representative of the sponsorship group, then they are required to invite the primary sponsor when they initiate the application. So the sponsor will get an invitation notifying them they have been added to the application. And in this case, the primary sponsor has the option to access the portal to view, to edit the application. And this is not necessary, however, as the principal applicant may just want to leave it up to their paid representative to solely access the portal to complete the application on their behalf. So the key reason the sponsor is being invited to the application is so they will receive the auto email notifications from the portal. When a group member is removed, the primary sponsor or the paid representative for the group and all invited persons are notified. So if someone is removed, everyone will be notified, all the, all the invited individuals and the primary sponsor. When an application has been submitted, the primary sponsor or the paid representative for the group and all invited persons are also notified. When an application is returned, only the primary sponsor or the paid representative for the group will be notified. So this is because they will need to ensure that the declaration is signed again once the issue is rectified. So please note that the application has been screened by an officer and is deemed complete. 
then there will be an acknowledgement of receipt email notification that will be sent externally from the portal. It will come from Roco email account and will include the G number. All other correspondence after this point will be done external to the portal. So this means that the process for sending or receiving updates on the application will remain the same as before the portal was even launched. So what cannot be submitted to IRCC via the portal? So one year window applications cannot be submitted to IRCC via the portal. You will submit these via email as per the current process. Similarly, the BVOR applications, so the blended visa office referred applications, these will also still be submitted via email as per the, the current process. JAS applications, so joint assistance sponsorship applications, SAS will submit these via email as per the current process. And when a new dependent needs to be added, so if you want to add a new dependent after already submitted the application, this will also be done outside of the portal. For any other updates on the sponsorship, sponsors should follow the current process, which is to submit changes via the IRCC web form. So the web form link is right here, and you'll also have access to it when we do share the slides with you. So I do believe this brings us to the end of our session today. I know it was quite long. Thank you so much for your patience. And I'll also like to share the contact information. Uh, so we do have a helpline which is available Monday to Friday, 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. Eastern time. So if you do not get to your question today, feel free to contact our helpline or you can also contact the local RSTP trainer, which you can find on our website here. Thank you so much, everyone, for participating. Feel free to reach out with any concerns, any questions you may have, and have a good rest of your day. Bye-bye.